Okay, so we are recording now, that's good. So Bobak is here, okay. Okay, so let's um, continue. So, um, okay, so now I think as I promised, we want to do Laplacian on Riemannian manifolds. So um, I, I introduced the idea last time, but I didn't give any details. So let me just give you a little bit of insight into our star operator, because we need it. So this is really some cool linear algebra. So it's just linear algebra, but it's kind of interesting linear algebra. So what is it? So uh, let's assume that uh, V is a finite dimensional uh, uh, vector space over R. It's a real finite dimensional real vector space. So let's uh, take which P of V to be a P exterior power of V. So what is this? This is just uh, p to tensor power, but then uh, you divide it by relations such that the two of the uh, entries of a tensor uh, is zero, uh, are, are the same, then the tensor has to be zero. So this is a space of anti-symmetric tensors. Anti-symmetric um, p tensors. Kind of idea. So then uh, we know that uh, dimension of this space, uh, there is a, a nice duality, dimension of this space is equal to dimension of which n minus p of b. Uh, so dimension of b, let's assume. equal to n. I mean, this follows from uh, this uh, binomial uh, thing that uh, this binomial coefficients n choose p, which is this dimension, is equal to n choose n minus p. This implies this. So then it follows from this that these two vector spaces are isomorphic. There is a nice duality between these two spaces because their dimensions are the same. So any two vector spaces of the same dimension are isomorphic. Uh, but uh, there is no natural isomorphism. That's, uh, that's the thing I want to emphasize, but not naturally. So in order to fix this isomorphism, we have to fix a basis and then write down the isomorphism, which is not what we want. So to get a natural isomorphism, uh, one standard way is uh, to fix an inner product on B. So this inner product uh, is positive definite, is on B and orientation. Uh, you will see soon why we need this orientation as well. They are just the inner product is not enough. Uh, we need it. Um, one of the things you can do immediately using inner product is that you can equip all tensor powers of V with inner product. So you get inner product um, again, I use the same notation on which P of B. This inner product works like this, uh, V1 which VP and then W1 
HW key is equal to the determinant of inner product of uh, this matrix that whose IJ component is WI, sorry, VI, WJ. So you form a P by P matrix. Its IJ component is VI, WJ. You take its determinant and uh, you can show that this is a positive definite inner product on which P. So this is for all P less than or equal to one, you know, equal to zero. You have this inner product, right? Um, then uh, let's um, um, then uh, we want to get um, so plain is that there exists a canonical isomorphism or natural isomorphism. We call it a star goes from which P of B to which N minus P of B, um, which is defined like this. Uh, first, uh, let's, um, but, 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 so, so let me introduce a notation for this orientation. So this orientation, uh, you can define it, orientation on a real vector space, you can define it in many ways, but uh, I'm gonna see it as uh, an element, which I guess I call the volume. So this is just a notation right now. I mean, think of this as one entity called the volume, which uh, belongs to uh, wedge N of V. So you, you fix a top exterior uh, element, non-zero. And this is your orientation. Uh, up to uh, scale multiplication, there are two of them up to sign. Uh, there is a class which all of them are positively related up to scale. There, there is another one which are not positively related. So this is, this is one orientation. So I fix an orientation by fixing that this element. So, um, so now this claim is not difficult to prove is that there exists a unique linear map linear map star from which P of B to which N minus P of B uh, such that um, star omega and eta is equal to omega and, uh, oh sorry, uh, D volume is equal to omega of H eta. So this is the uh, kind of basic relation that defines star for us. So um, now what is this uh, for any omega belonging to which peak? And for any eta belonging to which n minus. So this is an equality of uh, two tensors inside the top form uh, which n, right? Because right hand side, you have a P form, you have an n minus P form. You take the exterior product, you get an n, uh, n tensor. And here, this is already an n tensor, but this is a number that we uh, uh, can define using an uh, inner product, using this inner product, right? So we have this uh, now, um, this basic plane. So um, you can try to prove it if you have difficulty proving it. This is basic linear algebra for uh, representations of linear functionals in, on inner product spaces like, yeah. So that's uh, pretty standard, but it's good to remember the basic uh, defining property. So I believe, uh, so let me give some examples of this uh, using this, uh, then you can actually get some 
some examples uh, of how this works. I mean, uh, how this uh, how this star works then. So. It's, it's a theory of duality, right? Or the star. And um, between basically P forms and N minus P forms, which is a reflection of a duality that exists in binomial coefficients, uh, like the set of uh, all P element subsets of a set of N element is the same as the set of all N minus P element. I mean, is as the same cardinality as a set of all n minus p elements of a set of n elements again. So this is a this is a kind of yeah linear space version of that. So examples uh, one uh, first of all, let's um, check that the star of one is equal to um, uh, e one, which and so, uh, so let's fix an oriented uh, orthonormal basis for V. So I call this oriented orthonormal basis uh, E1, E2, EN. And then star of one, uh, so here a star goes from, of course, the zero of V, which is isomorphic to R, and one is there to the N of v, this element. And also you can show the, the other way around, star of E1, which EN is equal to, I believe, one, yes, without any signs, yes. And uh, in general, you can show that the star of, EI1, which EIP is equal to sine of this permutation EIP plus one, uh, which EIN, where sigma is this permutation. So, I have picked up some uh, subset of elements I1, I2, IP. I write it like that, and the remainder I write it as IP plus one, IN. And then I send this to one, two, and P, and then P plus one, and then N. So there is this permutation uh, that works like that, and then star is defined by. So you can see what's going on. Basically star like as the duality for sets. How do you define that duality? You just go to the complementary set, right? Here you go to the complement of that basis in some sense. I mean, yeah. So that's the thing. Uh, so third one is that this very important relation which follows from this actually is star composed with star is equal to minus one to the power n times n minus p, I believe, yes, n times n minus p identity. So this is as a map that goes from which p of v to itself. So um, star is not the perfect duality because star squared is not one, but it's plus minus one, depending on what, uh, order of P and N's are. Um, now, there is one very important, uh, very, very fundamental fact, which is this. For any oriented basis, F1, Fn of V. Now, this oriented basis need not be orthonormal, though. It's just an oriented basis, right? This need not be orthonormal, but it has to be oriented. F1, Fn of V. Uh, I'm going to show that you can construct the volume element in the following form. Uh, the volume is actually equal to square root of G uh, E1, 
wedge E n. Right? So when this G is equal to the determinant of uh, G i j, well, G i j matrix is the inverse of this matrix. Well, the metric matrix G i j is the inner product of G i i j. So, yes, that's, oh, no, no, sorry. That's one F n, sorry. Um, F1 H. You see, the volume was, uh, you remember, I defined it is E1 which EN, and that's actually independent of choice of oriented orthonormal basis. But now we have this beautiful formula that the volume form that we defined it using orthonormal basis can be defined in any non orthonormal basis by this formula. So this is. Uh, this is as uh, we will see immediately. This is very, very powerful. So we have this uh, relation. So this is an exercise I want you to do. This uh, fact. It's very important to, to check this for yourself. Okay. Yes. Excuse me, is that E I E J or F I? Uh, which one? The G I J. GIJ? Oh, GIJ are FI. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Baba. Yeah, these are FI. Of course. Yes, yes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, in fact, yeah, if it was FI, FJ, it would be EI, EJ, it would be one, right? Which is not. So the point of this construction is that you can construct that volume form without using uh, orthonormal basis. And this is going to be very, very important soon, right now, as we'll do. We go in. Yeah, this was a very good point. Thank you. Yeah, here should be, and this is FIJ, and uh, yeah, okay, good. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so now, um, so let's go over manifolds. This is a uh, end of linear algebra. So now let uh, MG, be a um, Riemannian manifold. Uh, but uh, I'm going to assume that it's also oriented. Um, can I ask you a quick question? Uh, sorry? Um, so one of the formulas, uh, the formula number three, shouldn't that be P times N minus P? Oh, is that right? I, um, I, maybe it's the same, but I don't, I, I remember it being P times M minus P, but I'm not sure. Yeah, it, you could be right, Jeremy. I mean, uh, you could be right, but I have N times N minus P. Um, but uh, would be a good idea to check actually here. I mean, if, uh, if dimension is even, then this would imply that this is even. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think I think this should be p times n minus p somehow. Yeah, I I, I, I think I think this should be p times n minus p because if uh, it was n, then for even dimensional things, this star square would always be equal to one. For some other reason, I know that this is even in that case, that's not always a square to one. So yeah, I I, I just checked on Wikipedia. I think that is the correct formula in that. Uh, p times m minus p. Yeah, p times m. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I have some other evidence that also should be correct for me. Right. Excellent. Very good. Thanks. Any other comments, corrections? Okay. Very good. So now we go to mani over to manifold. So it's a Riemannian manifold and oriented. Oriented. So um, then uh, the volume four. Is equal to um, um, as uh, we defined uh, over there is a square root of determinant of G. Uh, so my notation is uh, this is dx1 uh, range dx1. So in any uh, coordinate chart. Uh, 
uh, x1, x1. I mean, local coordinate charts uh, on some neighborhood. Uh, so, because you have uh, now we are working on dual space, right? So, so we have this basis di equal to ddxi. And the dual ones, dxi defined by acting on dj to be equal to delta ij. So, so Riemannian means that tangent space uh, has got a metric, so it's dual space, uh, it has also a metric in a natural way. And we can bring all this technology to dual space, and then dual of the dual is going to be the original space. And so, some nice stuff now happens. So this is the first one, this volume four is well defined. So, so, so you see, to define the volume four because of this result, I don't have to fix a frame. I can just use a coordinate chart. So that's uh, handier uh, to, to work with. And then um, you notice that we have this, uh, uh, so the star, I can get the star going from omega p of n to omega n minus p of n. So of course, dimension of n is equal to n. Uh, in the following way, so these are uh, p folds, right? So this is a small sections of the p to exterior power of the cotangent on them, right? So it, it's going to gain minus p cotangent bundle. So what we are going to do, we are, uh, so this star is purely algebraic. So we apply the operation pointwise and then uh, get, uh, get it on sections. So, so what I'm saying is that First, you define a star at x from which p, p star x n to which n minus p, t star m x, right? Uh, Pointwise for any x belonging to m, thanks to this algebraic uh, pure linear algebra construction. And then you get the uh, Again, same notation, I use a star, you go from sections to sections, so it's the infinity of, okay, so it's P of T star and T infinity. So this will be questions, how to define it now? I, I told you how to define it. Greater than minus P T star of M. And of course, as I said, this is omega P, of M and this is omega M minus P. So that's uh, Hodge star. So you see, Hodge star is a completely a linear, uh, yeah, it's completely algebraic operation. There's no differentiation involved in Hodge star. It's, it's algebraic. Just linear algebra. Okay, so um, now um, to see some of the deeper properties, let us introduce an inner product on P forms. Uh, so this inner product I just denoted by this omega omega prime carry bracket is going to be integral over m. Um, uh, inner product of omega and omega prime uh, d volume. Uh, so it's standard to call this d volume g to, to show that this really depends on g. And also depends on orientation because uh, otherwise we won't get the right thing here, right? So this is the volume uh, G. So what is this? Uh, this is a pointwise construction. That's uh, like thanks to this linear algebra, you can do pointwise. 
you get a number, and this is an n form. You integrate this n form over the manifold. Of course, I mean your manifold has to be, for example, compact. But if your manifold is not compact, you can just work with forms with compact support, for example. So then you have a pre-Hilbert space, right? So in this way, um, you get this um, pre-Hilbert space. A pre-Hilbert space. It could be real or complex, depending on if you work with real or complex uh, forms. Right? It doesn't matter right now. Uh, so uh, structure on omega p of m for all p. So this is structure again is a curly uh, bracket. Uh, I have a question. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, this, this. Uh, uh, how, how do you define the the the, the in the 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 in the pointwise inner product of two um uh key forms again? Is it the thing where you have two wedges? Then you take the determinant of all the possible inner products. Um. So what what you did? Uh, what you have to use just the, the linear algebra part that I developed. You have the metric, so it means that you have inner product on the tangent space. So you have inner product on the cotangent space, and this is just exterior peak exterior power of the cotangent space. So you have that, right? Okay, right. So you have the so it's a I mean linear algebra is set up in such a way that takes care of all these things, yeah. Uh, but then there is yeah indeed if you choose the dual basis, you have that determinant formula that you can apply to get these, uh, but. But conceptually, it's very clear that uh, we are using that section I developed first. Uh, to get that. So this is pre Hilbert space. If you want, you can complete it. But right now, I don't need that completion. I just use it as a pre Hilbert space. OK, so, so then we get uh, so definition of the star implies the following relation that star of omega and eta is equal to integral omega base eta over m. So this is uh, a fundamental relation. So uh, this is say, so of course, um, uh, this is for any omega belonging to omega p of m. So n eta belonging to omega n minus p of m. You see, when I was doing linear algebra, we didn't have this integration, but here we just had the pointwise relation like this. Now, if you do uh, globally, then you get uh, the inner product which is integral on the left hand side, and you integrate, you get that on the right hand side. So we have this equality. This is fundamental, right? So star omega eta is equal to, but this is just base product of an n form which you can uh, integrate over, over n. Right. Is that clear? Okay. So using that now, um, so uh, one idea is to define an adjoint of uh, uh, D. So D Durham goes from omega P of M to omega N minus P of M, right? Oh, sorry, <laughs> to omega P plus one of M. So now we are going to define an operator D star, which um, goes uh, the other way around. So this operator D star. Uh, I have a question. Yes, yes. Uh, no. So here uh, we define the inner product of uh, the inner product of star, star omega and eta, but. Uh, if we do the integration of omega wedge eta, then it may not always be positive. Uh, no, it turns out, well, I mean, nobody said that uh, this is positive because I mean, uh, I mean, this is an inner product in some vector space. But uh, if you take omega, I mean, wedge, uh, you cannot take omega wedge, wedge uh, omega again, I mean, uh, because the, the, the inner product that I defined is positive definite. So, um, 
No, I mean, this is not an inner product. This is just the result of this product of these two things. You see, you cannot take omega and eta equal here because they live in different spaces. This is some sort of adjunction formula. But uh, I mean, uh, the left hand side is always positive or zero, but uh, the, no, 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 no. the right hand side. No, no, the left hand side is not always positive. Why? Let me see. No, I mean, look, I mean, uh, left hand side, uh, we have, uh, you know, omega and omega p, a time. I mean, uh, we just take uh, this, uh, this is, this is slowly happens in, yes, I mean, this is in omega n minus p, omega n minus p, but uh, it's not always positive. Mm -hmm. It's, it's just inner product of two vectors, right? Uh, okay. So, okay, I see, uh, I will check it again. Yeah, because uh, you cannot take again, uh, omega and eta to be the same, by the way, yeah, because they are in different spaces. But it's true that indeed, the star of omega is in the same space as eta. So if a star of omega is equal to eta, then this should be positive. Mm -hmm. But then the star of omega is equal to eta. Not okay. not omega, right? Okay, so I will check it again. Okay. Okay, sure. No, no, yeah, no, no. fine. Very good. So now um, let's define this star to be equal to minus one to the power uh, n p plus n plus one uh, star v star. So. If you uh, look at the way that this V acts uh, and star acts twice, this actually goes from omega P of M to omega P minus one of M. So this decreases degree. Decreases degree by one. Okay? But D increases degree by one, right? Now we want to show that actually this D star is adjoint of D. So this lemma is that uh, D star is the formal uh, adjoint of D. So uh, we have this uh, omega p m d omega p plus one, and here is the other way around in the in the sense that we have this relation d omega and eta is equal to omega and d star of eta for um, all Omega p, omega p, and for all eta in omega p plus one. So this really shows that, uh, I mean, in the sense of linear algebra, actually, we don't care about the technical definition of adjoint in Hilbert space context, which is totally different. I mean, it's, it's a bit uh, complicated for, for right now. Well, it's not complicated, but we have to be careful. That's all I mean. I meant. But here we just use, uh, use it in a formal sense. Uh, sometimes you can call it as a, as a symmetric condition or symmetric. So it's just this is equal to that, right? Okay, so we have that now proof. Uh, so you just use the Stokes formula, I mean, um, or differential, differential form integrals, use the Stokes formula. Uh, e.g. for any closed manifold. So closed from now on means compact without boundary, right? Compact without boundary, a manifold um, integral of d omega over m is equal to zero where um, omega belongs to omega n minus one of m and n is dimension of m. 
So, of course, we are assuming here uh, n is a closed manifold for this formula, or you can prove the same thing if you assume that you are working with forms with compact support or forms that vanish at infinity, some growth condition at infinity. I mean, away from some compact sets, uh, that's okay. But assume it's closed manifolds, that's enough for us now. So, we just have this condition. So this, this is Stokes theorem is true, and uh, you can use this uh, to derive this uh, beautiful relationship. Um, yeah, so I'm not saying more here. So that's that's it. I mean, can I ask you a question, please, Master? Oh, sure, sure, sure. Uh, so if we have direct sum of those gamma p's then we don't get positive definiteness of these inner products. Uh, direct sums of these things? Direct sum of those gamma p's, like. Oh, you mean omega p? Yeah, sorry, yeah, omega. Yeah. No, no, you do, I mean, uh, that's okay, because these are like direct sums of pre-Hilbert spaces, then again is a pre-Hilbert space, right? Okay, so we get positive definiteness in that case, I guess. I mean, it would be a real adjoint, that star. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, right, I mean, uh, you do, I mean, but adjoint, uh, I mean, no, no, I mean, this is not a Hilbert space, and these are not bounded operators, so these are, you, you know, you, you know about unbounded operators, I'm sure, yes. so to define the adjoint of an unbounded operator, you have to be careful, I mean, and to prove that an operator is actually the actual adjoint, it, it takes a lot of work, but here we don't deal with that. We just just this relation formal formal. You know what I mean? Yes. I I know, but I I, I see it like an operation a star on Clifford algebras, and then maybe getting a CSR algebra. I, I'm wrong, or we will get something like that. Uh... Well, yeah, I mean, it can be that this this can be done in any context. Really, it's a very very general context for just inner product spaces and what it means for an operator, linear operator, from one inner product space to another inner product space to have another operator as its adjoint. It's just just this. You can take this as a definition, like from linear algebra, from basic linear algebra, right? That's. Okay. Uh, that's what we verified. Yeah, uh, we can discuss it later on if you want. Okay, thank you. Uh, sorry, just just a quick follow up uh, for uh, Yavar's uh, question. Okay. Uh, so like, you didn't prove the existence or existence of what? Uh, existence of like uh, if you have uh, so this is like a sim symbolic equation, but so if you have uh, let's say d, then the star of eta is is like something. You know, may, maybe there is not there is nothing that satisfies this this equation. No, no. I mean, uh, first of all, we are working on uh, smooth forms only, right? We are just okay. on the space of a smooth forms. We are not on the full Hilbert space, which that operator is not defined even because it's an unbounded yep. operator. But on the on the on this uh, smooth forms, the star is defined. I, I defined it by purely algebraic relation and then d. So everything is defined. And oh, you, right. Yeah, I'm not using, yeah, I know, but I'm not using this to. Okay, this. I got it. Yeah, so the genius of Hodge was that he realized that there is this explicit construction that allows you to construct the adjoint of T. I mean, I know, I mean, so in general, you can say any operator has an adjoint in some form or sense. You might, yeah, I mean, at least in some country. But that's not what he used. He just, you know, went along and, and just constructed this operator explicitly. So that's the uh, beauty of his construction, right? Yeah, great, okay. thanks. One, very good, these are very good questions, thank you. Yeah. So now I can define my uh, Laplacian, after all, so definition. Uh, so Laplacian, on P forms. So this delta P maybe goes from omega P of M 
to omega P of n. So delta P uh, is defined to be D plus D star uh, squared, which is D D star plus D star D. If you follow through these uh, degree changes uh, for this, you notice that you start from omega P and then you land in P forms, one thing. And also why this is equal to that, that the reason for that is that uh, because this squared is equal to zero, this is fundamental, we know. This implies that the star is squared equal to zero, but it, because this is just star squared is plus minus one, then drops from the middle, you get this, this squared equal to zero implies the star squared equal to zero. And then this also implies that d plus the star squared is equal to d d star plus d star d. That's what I used over there. So this is clear, right? So this is Laplacian on P forms. Uh, well, usually we denote uh, delta zero just by delta. So this goes from zero form, which is C infinity of m, uh, to C infinity of m. So this one uh, is kind of important uh, historically and for whatever reason. This is uh, called uh, scalar Laplacian, right? Okay. So now in this case, then delta is actually equal to d star composed with d. So, so this is almost like the advanced calculus definition of Laplacian, which is like gradient composed with uh, divergence, right? So that's like divergence composed with gradient. Indeed, uh, it is d is like gradient in this uh, differential form uh, world, and d star is like divergence, and so this kind of uh, it should remind you is a reminiscence of this uh, calculus formula, which is. <laughs> Excuse me, there is a question. Yes, yes. There is a question that says, does D star give rise to singular homology? Uh, D star gives rise to singular homology. Well, D does. Uh, D star. Um, Oh yeah, singular homology, D star. Oh, that's a good question actually, because I know what, uh, well, D, do, D gives rise to singular homology. I mean, the, the, yeah, I mean, because D gives us uh, the wrong cohomology and that kind of pairs with singular homology. Uh, now you're saying if D star itself is singular homology, there might be, but I have to think about it. That's that's a good question, actually. Who asked this question? Uh, it's from Torin. Oh, Torin, you're right there. Okay, yeah, I think that's that's uh, that's a good question. I have to think about it, but they're, they're, it might be true. But I never thought about it actually. <laughs> that's, a, that's 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 a, that's a nice question. But D does. I, I will mention this now, actually. Okay, so but let's get some. Nasty formulas first. So Laplacian in local coordinates. So you can show that by some work actually that uh, Laplacian of F is equal to one over square root of g uh, di uh, root g uh, gij um, uh, dj uh, f yes where uh, gij of course equal to inner product of di dj and gij up is gij inverse. 
Yes. Okay, so, uh, okay, and of course, G is uh, now, this is now very unfortunate, but that's okay. Is equal to determinant of G I J. Because I use this G for the metric, right? So, but now I'm using it for the determinant of G I J as well. But, okay, I, I hope you forgive me for doing this, but this is also standard. Uh, just to clarify, uh, the, when you write Laplacian F, this is the uh, Laplacian sub zero, right? Yeah, that, that, exactly, exactly. Okay. This is delta, which is delta zero. So okay. this is uh, F is F, so yeah, exactly. So F belongs to C, right? So we can write now, this is important, so uh, note. So the important thing to note that actually, uh, you see uh, this Laplacian of F is equal to, um, yes, uh, Gij uh, minus Gij Di Dj F plus uh, lower order Terms. So this is this part, top part. So, so in, in general coordinates uh, where the metric uh, could have non-trivial components, uh, Laplacian is given by this term, which is the top part. Uh, so you are just second differentiating, and then there is this lower order term. So you differentiate one more, but so there is some junk, so to speak, that appears here. But this by itself is not well defined, right? This coordinate dependent. I mean, it's kind of conceptually, it's kind of tempting to define that over general manifold as your Laplacian, but that's not correct because this depends on coordinates. But the definition that we gave here, it's coordinate independent, of course, and then this uh, kind of monstrous formula uh, is the coordinate independent definition. But then when you do this, uh, use the uh, Leibniz rule, right? If you use Leibniz rule, you get this as a uh, top part, <clears throat> second order term, plus lower order terms. So this is, we will use it later on. So keep that in mind, please. Okay, so uh, maybe uh, if you don't have questions, maybe I'll just give some examples at least. So just to make sure the top formula uh, should be with a minus sign? Yes, it is the minus sign. Uh, and here there is also minus. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yeah, this formula that I gave here, there is no minus sign here. That's fine. This is, this is, this is the um, kind of invariant formula. That's the right formula. And this uh, came out to be minus and here there's minus, yes. Indeed, yes. Because that's the positive definite operator. Not quite definite, but positive operator. I, I will mention this actually in a second. Right. Any other comments or questions? Okay, so let's uh, continue. So here is an example. Um, so ds squared equal to sum dxi squared, right? i from one to one, so flat metric. So you can follow your nose in this definition. And in this case, you of course get uh, delta is equal to minus sum d2 dxi squared, right? So this is the usual so for, so for flat metric, uh, we have the standard Laplacian that you know from, uh, from calculus here, right? And then for, so maybe a couple of more interesting examples. So example, 
two. So let's look at hyperbolic uh, metric. So for hyperbolic metric. Uh, so this is ds2 is equal to dx squared divided squared over y2. So this your manifold, of course, is for very upper half plane, right? Oh, y positive, sorry. So this is Poincare upper half plane. So one of the most important manifolds in the world is this uh, hyperbolic space, Poincaré upper half plane. So this space has constant curvature minus one. This is the metric. And what is the Laplacian in this case? Well, Laplacian is equal to minus y squared times the standard Laplacian is d2 dx2 plus d2 dy2. Again, you, using these general formulas, you can check by going into, this is already one coordinate system. There's no, it's just it's, it's a simply connected space, right? So minus, <coughs> so this, this is also a nice formula. Um, so then I can now say a little more about the, the kind of related to the question that was asked about uh, homology. So by, uh, relation to Hodge theory, so I'll just say. So note that uh, Laplacian is a, is, a, is a positive self adjoint operator. It is a positive, again, I just say formally self adjoint operator. Uh, so what does it mean? It means that, uh, well, delta star is equal to delta. So it means that inner product of delta F and G is equal to actually delta P, then I would say. Um, uh, omega and eta is equal to omega and delta eta for any omega is belonging to So this of course follows from this relation that this is d d star plus d star d and that d star star is equal to d because uh, that's what you're doing is just formal and formally to check that uh, yeah, that d star is the adjoint of d, so it means d star star is equal to d. So if you use this towards that, you get that equation. And positivity means that for all uh, omega belonging to, and this is also easy because um, you have uh, d star. Plus the star d. I mean, what can we do? I mean, this is this omega omega. So this is equal to we can just write it now as d star omega d star omega plus d omega d omega. So this is bigger than equal to zero. This is bigger. So it's a positivity of the thing. And from here, you notice that actually kernel of Laplacian is equal to kernel of D intersection kernel of D star. So now the eigenspaces of this are what uh, of, of interest in the spectral geometry. So spectrum, so, so now I'm assuming N is a closed. Uh, for now, I'm still taking orientation condition oriented Riemannian manifold. Uh, 
Then uh, the big theorem that um, I may prove, as I said in the beginning, uh, we have this uh, spectral decomposition theorem. Um, so, for example, for p equal to zero, we have L2 of m is direct sum of p e lambdas from the i from zero up to infinity, where lambda zero bigger than equal to zero less than or equal to lambda one. Is the spectrum of delta equal to delta zero? So the spectrum, of course, means uh, y i equal to lambda i y i or y i is different from zero. And part of this spectral decomposition theorem is that. First of all, exactly like the domains that we worked on our end, uh, in this case, also there is a discrete set of eigenvalues. Each, each eigenvalue has finite multiplicity. From this positivity result, we get that first, I mean, they, sh they can now be negative, but they can be zero, and they go to infinity. So this is called the spectrum of this Laplacian. So also, right? So this is the spectrum of the Laplacian, and the spectrum of the composition term. So this is e lambda i equal to kernel of uh, delta minus lambda i. Is is the lambda i eigenspace of that uh, eigenvalue? Uh, now, uh, well, lambda zero is equal to zero. In other words, in case of manifolds uh, without boundary and compact, which we assume has to be compact, uh, I've, I'll tell you what goes wrong in the non-compact case. Uh, everything goes wrong in the non-compact case. Uh, there is an eigenvalue of zero. Why? For example, one is in the spectrum, right? Delta of one is equal to zero. Uh, so zero is an eigenvalue for sure. But then now the question is what is multiplicity of zero as an eigenvalue? Can you tell me what is the multiplicity of zero as an eigenvalue? Should be one, right? Because of a maximum principle of harmonic functions. Yes, uh, but be careful. I did not assume my manifold is connected, right? Oh. So that's equal to number of connected components of the manifold in general, right? For example, in one component can be one, in the other component can be two, and so on. So, but if uh, it's connected, then uh, your uh, the, the multiplicity is one, right? So let me write it then. So harmonic functions on M and satisfy this condition, and then maximum principle. As you said, implies that if n is compact, then uh, the dimension of uh, E0 is equal to number of connected components of, of um, this. Uh, and manifold. So if I'm connected, uh, 
Um, of course, and compact, of course, is that uh, lambda zero equal to zero is a simple eigenvalue. That's uh, significant to bear in mind, is a simple eigenvalue. Uh, I don't know about the next one. Uh, I think the next one in general could be non-simple, but uh, I don't have an example right now, but we can think about it later. But uh, in general, of course, the eigenvalues will be non-simple. We will have multiplicity. Uh, and that's an important issue. So that's as far as function goes, functions, the scalar of us. If you go to forms of Laplacian, some interesting things happen. So, so um, in general, so this uh, we have this uh, famous Hodge composition theorem and Hodge theory. It implies that um, dimension of kernel of Delta P is equal to DP. This is the peak petty number. Petty number of P. So, um, right. So, um, now let me, uh, okay. So, this is equal to dimension of. For example, you, you can define it uh, through singular homology or uh, Durand cohomology, dimension of HP Durand of M over R. And so this is um, harmonic stuff. Uh, so this follows, as I said, from Hodge theory. Um, okay, so it needs, uh, so yeah, there are many, many references, but I also have some videos on YouTube where I proved this result towards index theorem. I mean, the index theorem, we haven't got there yet, so I hope I get uh, back to finish those series of videos, lectures from summer. But uh, certainly, proof of Hodge decomposition here on Hodge theory, main statement Hodge theory for Riemannian manifold, not for complex manifolds. For Riemannian manifolds is there, so you can do it. Okay. Any questions or comments? Uh, I just have a quick question. So, this question uh, someone asked earlier about whether or not D star gives rise to singular homology. Like, wouldn't you just get the ROM cohomology, but with the arrows reversed or something? Yes. Um, I have um, something tells me, yeah, I mean, that, that should be the case. Because, like, this, the Hodge star is an isomorphism, so it just seems like you would just reverse yeah. all the arrows. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think I think you're right. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, uh, so a safe way to do that would be first to assume that you have a finite complex, right? Just a finite uh, chain complex, like over 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 R. Just that, so there's no, no torsion issues, nothing. And you take uh, uh, cohomology of this. So in each dimension of cohomology. So put some metrics and dualize. You get this dual thing. And then uh, I think indeed in that case, it's actually true that uh, the cohomology of this dual complex is isomorphic to cohomology of the original complex. I think, I think, I think you're right in that case. But what uh, makes me a bit worried though is that uh, in this case, we, we are dealing with infinite dimensional uh, complexes. So for example, omega P is an infinite dimensional space and these are um, so, but maybe it's still the, the argument goes through. I mean, I have to. So I would suggest all of you first think about the finite dimensional case, do the finite dimensional case, and then see if you can boost your result to, the, to this infinite dimensional complexes. 
So that would be, that would be. But I, my hunch is that you're right, actually. Yeah, you're quite right. Thanks for mentioning that. Yeah. Very good. So, uh, yeah, yes. Yeah, so, so I was wondering if there is sort of a, um, sort of a general, like, as you mentioned, if the, the, if the dimension is finite, then we can do whatever we did here and right. then define Laplacian and everything. Yes, yes. Right. And then we can prove, I, I believe, a Hodge theory, that is the dimension is equal to the kernel and stuff like that. So yeah. I was wondering, uh, so especially my, my, my question comes uh, from like, yeah, so, so sorry if my, my voice is not good. So especially my question uh, comes from considering group uh, cohomologies for, for like infinite groups, right? So I was wondering whether there is uh, a sort of general uh, theory that has been sort of uh, that has been developed for for considering like infinite dimensional uh, vector spaces. So there is there like such an abstract thing? And yes, like yes, I, yeah, I, I think there is a there is an abstract Hodge theory actually. Yeah, for infinite dimensional vector spaces, I think so. Yeah, I mean because in that case uh, you want to do group cohomology. Also, you want to do this sort of define secondary invariants and determinants and these things. And indeed, uh, there is an abstract uh, Hodge theory developed uh, in that case. I think there is something like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I, I, should... I can send you references, yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, okay, yeah. that would be great. I, I think I can, so just send me an email and then I can send you a reference, yeah. I think I know there is some abstract uh, Hodge theory. People. Yeah, I mean, people try to develop this. Maybe you can apply it in other combinatorial contexts, for example, like in, in group cohomology and singular cohomology and all these things, yeah. So yeah. that, yeah. The groups that I have in mind are, are uh, like infinite, you know, discrete and infinite. I, I yes, always yes. wonder. Yes, yes. I mean, yeah, I think it's actually done uh, to deal with those things, actually, yeah. Oh, really? Okay, that would be great. I'll send you an email. Yeah, I think so. yeah, I, great, I think thanks. I'll send, you, I'll send you a reference. That's a good question. Yeah. Thanks. No, no, sure, sure, sure. So well, that's very good. So uh, now let me uh, maybe along this line of this Hodge theory, maybe harmonic forms. So in general, um, kernel of delta P, this is called the space of harmonic um, P forms on M. So this is uh, usually we can be noted by RP uh, of M. So this uh, Hodge theory uh, main statement I mean, is that this map from harmonic uh, P forms on M to H P Durand of M. Uh, we send a harmonic form, just harmonic, to its class here is an isomorphism of vector spaces. So in other words, it shows that every Durand cohomology class has a unique harmonic representative, which is uh, represents that uh, class by a form, not a quotient, uh, not, not in the quotient space. It's really a form, it's a harmonic form. And of course this, as I said before, I mean, it's kernel of the intersection, kernel of this stuff, right? So this, so it must be closed and co-closed, the harmonic people. So now the, the question uh, is about isometries, of course. Oh yeah, well, one question now I want to say, uh, uh, so this is a nice exercise actually. And I want you to show that the definition of Laplacian is independent of choice of orientation. Yeah. So 
So it's kind of funny. We use the orientation to define this uh, uh, Hodge star and then this star and all these things. But at the end of the day, um, at least for Laplacian, uh, it's independent of the choice of orientation. If you switch to the negative, to the opposite orientation, your Laplacian doesn't change, in other words. So I want you to see that. So if you are on a non-orientable manifold, can you choose local orientations and patch it? Yes. To get a global Laplacian? Yes, you can choose any coordinate system. I use that formula and you have the Laplace. And everything works if your space, of course, is uh, compact, right? If your space is not compact, then you get into this issue of continuous Laplacians. Uh, sorry, continuous spectrum. So actually, let me mention that now. So this is one exercise. Definition of delta P is independent of choice of orientation. That's one thing. Uh, but of course, I mean, be careful. It heavily de depends on the choice of metric. I mean, it's inconceivable to think of Laplacian without the metric, almost. Uh, but it still depends on G. Um, now, uh, what happens on non compact spaces? Um, so, on non compact spaces, uh, I would say um, all hell breaks loose. So, let's look at the case. Even in the simplest case, m equal to r, um, and then delta equal to minus d2 dx2 standard metric. I mean, uh, this, uh, first of all, you can show that um, this operator uh, doesn't have any bounded or, um, I mean, any L2 kind of. Uh, Spectrum. No true spectrum. So, in other words, if you want to say delta phi equal to lambda phi, um, well, I mean, you can try to solve this. What is it? Minus phi double prime is equal to lambda phi. I mean, here you have these uh, at least for. Lambda bigger than equal to zero, you have this plane wave solution, so to speak, phi of x equal to e to the um, i x dot, uh, uh, I would say, uh, uh, okay, maybe square root of lambda, right? Taking this, I mean, it looks like that you have got uh, these guys. Uh, but the thing is, these uh, plane wave solutions are not L2. Um, so basically, and they are not discrete either. So by, by discrete, I mean that the whole uh, right hand side. Is actually is in the continuous spectrum. So here, all these points give you some uh, formal uh, funny solutions like this. Uh, so, but 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 first of all, the space of uh, where the spectrum leaves. Uh, is not uh, discrete. I mean, yeah, just a continuous spectrum. So we have this issue of continuous spectrum. Uh, so this is a very important issue. So it means that over non-compact spaces, we have to deal with totally different issues. I mean, uh, even the definition of a spectrum is not uh, true eigenvalues. And spectrum is different from eigenvalues. 
Uh, because if you want to work in, in a kind of L2 context, hyperspace context, there are no L2, uh, uh, I mean, points in the spectrum, but still you can define spectrum in, 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 in a precise way uh, by the other definition through that resolvent definition, but uh, then, then you have to bring in more functional analysis. So that's not, uh, what we want to do uh, right now. So this is a this is a totally different world, and it's much more complicated to analyze non-compact spaces through the uh, Laplacian in a way. But for now, we are just sticking to uh, compact, uh, closed, indeed without boundary spaces. Okay. Any questions? I have a question, please. Yes. Yes. Uh, so related to the question somebody asked that we if uh, if the manifold is not orientable, then we can confine ourselves to a coordinate patch. Yes, but then we get a manifold with boundary. Um, I think what he meant that you just work locally and then you just in, in one coordinate system, you have an expression for Laplace. I mean, because the formula that I wrote also it could be just on, on some small domain i mean there are some boundaries for that maybe but that's okay i mean you know what i mean uh i mean restricted to that patch you are dealing with a different problem it's not a closed manifold anymore without boundary no i mean restricting to a patch you're always dealing with a small part of the manifold it's it's unavoidable though to, to write down formulas, uh, you have to restrict to, to some coordinate chart or patch, right? Otherwise you don't have global coordinates. Uh, so that's, I think, I think the issue is that formula that I wrote is independent of choice of orientations at the end. So, and actually in the formula, there is no orientation. Well, I said G, I mean, uh, you choose it in that coordinate patch, but yeah, I think I, I can explain it later on. Okay, thank you, thank you. Sure, sure. Okay, so now what we want to do next is um, to discuss uh, this a little bit about isometries and uh, again, the same issue and then uh, formulate. Uh, so isometries, Of Riemannian manifolds. Uh, so phi from one Riemannian manifold to another Riemannian manifold, of course, is an isometry uh, if, of course, uh, you want phi to be one one onto smooth, right, uh, plus um, preserving the metric. So by metric preserving, uh, you can uh, formulate it like this, e.g. this differential of this going from tangent space of uh, this at any x to tangent space of n and prime at phi uh, of x uh, preserves the inner point. This metric preserving, um, or equivalently, you can say phi star of g prime is equal to g, or uh, equivalently, you can say that uh, phi, okay, so the length of phi of uh, gamma is equal to length of gamma for any smooth curve. Um, so let me put it like this, uh, actually. Um, distance between phi of x and phi of y is equal to distance between x and y for all x and y. And where this distance between two points on your manifold, 
uh, like distance between x and y by definition is infimum of lengths of gamma. Uh, gamma is uh, small scales that connect uh, x to y, say at distance at, uh, I mean, yeah, parameters by interval zero, one. The parameterization doesn't matter. Uh, well, length of gamma. So you just uh, measure the length, the distance by measuring lengths and taking the minimum. And uh, this length, of course, is exactly the formula that Riemann gave us length of gamma is equal to equal zero to one square root of ds squared. It's actually kind of cool to write it like this, length of gamma. So what this means is it goes zero to one square root of g uh, i j x i x j. So this integral is a line integral is calculated over this metric, right? So what is gamma? Gamma, of course, goes from zero, one <coughs> to n, smooth curve. So all these definitions are equivalent. This is kind of a standard, uh, and it's not difficult to prove that they're all the same. Uh, say, saying the same thing, it means that the two manifolds really in the category of Riemannian manifolds are the same kind of objects, except relabeled and renamed uh, points and metrics. So that's the uh, same thing. So this is the notion of isometry. Now the isometry group of a Riemannian manifold, so I just define it G by definition be equal to isometry groups, uh, the, the group of all isometries of NG. So this is the set of all phi from NG to itself that uh, phi deserves metric. I mean, it's an isometry, right? So this is an important group that you attach to a Riemannian manifold. Uh, this group, uh, in general, uh, some nice stuff is known about this group. Uh, first of all, so I, I believe this result is due to Stinrod. Uh, Prove that uh, isometry group of G is, is always a, is a locally compact Lie group. Uh, to say locally compact Lie group is a kind of redundancy because a Lie group is locally compact. So, I mean, I even should not even say that, right? Um, uh, but it is compact. If and only if G is compact. I'm uh, sorry, M is compact. I'm sorry. So that's a, that's an important group. So let me give you some examples. Take M equal to Rn, of course, I saw and standard metric and flat metric, right? flat Euclidean. Uh, then, of course, isometries of M is orthogonal group, semi direct product with translations, right? So that's, uh, that's, that's the EN group, Euclidean. Is it really if and only if? I mean, I think we can construct non-compact manifolds with trivial isometry group. Uh, you can construct a compact manifold with trivial isometry group. Yeah, no, that's no, no. non-compact. Uh, you can construct a compact manifold with a non-compact. Uh, no, no, no. non-compact manifold with uh -huh. a trivial isometry group. 
Oh, because you said if and only if. I think it is only implication from left, uh, from right to left here. Oh, oh, oh yeah, I think, I think yeah, because I mean your space may be non-compact, but it's so wild that doesn't have many isometries actually. It's possible. It's possible. Yeah, someone should check this thing out as well, by the way. Yeah, so n compact. Uh, um, so, certainly, but I mean, yeah, that's a good point. I, I'm not sure. May, I think maybe you're right. I think so. Thanks for mentioning. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we should check this exactly. Yeah, but certainly, if it's compact, then G is compact. Uh, so another example, M equal to, um, say, from gray over half plane. And the hyperbolic metric. Uh, in this case, I saw the trees of this H. Uh, do you know what is the isometry group in this case? SL to R? Uh, PSL to R, right, right. Yeah. Uh, it's PSL to R, which is SL to R divided by plus minus one. And in fact, the way SL to R acts, uh, it sends uh, for any ABCD belonging to SL to R. Um, you define its action over some complex number just uh, to be a uh, Mobius transformation. You can show that this actually um, sends over half plane to over half plane, of course, it's one 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 two da, 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 uh, and preserves the metric. But then uh, you need some work to show that these are all the isometries. But because uh, plus one and minus one here in SO2R act on the same way because you're dividing, so cancel. So you have to divide by that. So this was discovered by Poincaré actually. <laughs> Just a little historical note. Poincaré has a very nice uh, story about this. He says that he was thinking about this problem in a very, very uh, kind of, uh, long uh, in, in quite a long time and then he forgot about it and then one day he was getting into a bus or some tram and then when he jumped off the bus immediately it came to him that these are the isometries and this is the importance of uh, this group sl2r which uh, uh, so so he, he discovered the relation between euclidean non-euclidean geometry and the automorphic forms uh, so we will see a little bit of that soon. So that's what was noticed by Poincaré. That's so. Um, um, okay, so the plan now is like this. Um, we are going now to work uh, with some uh, special class of manifolds. So, so let me just write down now, uh, first of all, one of the things that <clears throat> So here is an exercise. Is show that um, uh, isometric manifolds have the same spectrum. I mean Laplace spectrum. So it means uh, what you, what we mean is that the spectrum of LP on M is actually equal to a spectrum of um, I mean delta P and prime for all uh, P equal to I mean zero one M. So if you have two isometric manifolds, they are isospectral. Actually, this is a strong sense in the sense that the all, all eigenvalues of all p-forms are the same. 
not just for functions, they are all the same. So this is part of this exercise. And um, so isometric, in other words, as we saw before in a special case, implies isospectral. Okay. So then the question of a spectral geometry, the inverse problem, can be formulated like this now. So inverse problem. Of this G, you can say, uh, does isospectral implies isometric? I can even say isospectral for all peaks, for example. This is a kind of more general than the original thing, but you can even ask that. Does isospectral imply um, isometric? So now our, our immediate goal to show that the answer is no, and give the first example. And so we are going to construct two tori. Flat tori. Um, Rm mod gamma and Rm mod gamma prime for n equal to 16. Uh, so this is your manifold M and your manifold M prime such that M and N prime are isospectral. But not isometric. Uh, so this was historically important. The first example that was found, this is due to Milner. But as I will explain, uh, Milner's genius was to realize that there was a result ready-made for him in, in number theory, theory of lattices, which is very important part of number theory, very deep uh, theory, was done by Ernst Heath, uh, Witt. I believe in 1940, he constructed these lattices gamma eight, GX sum gamma eight, and gamma 16. So this is gamma, this is gamma prime. So my job is to describe gamma, gamma prime, and to show that these manifolds, flat tori are uh, isospectral which takes a lot of work to show the horizon spectra, but then with less work to show that they are not isometric and then uh, we go from there. So that's our immediate goal now. So this example is so cool and so nice. It's six in dimensional and then the, the job was to bring dimension down, 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 down. In each case you, yeah. So thank you so much guys for your attention. So any questions or comments? I have one question about the relation between the compactness of the group and the manifold. Yes, yes. Maybe the following is true that if you have a, a compact group, then there exists a compact manifold uh, such that its uh, isometric group is compact. Is it true or? So if you have a compact group, you mean there, you, you want to say that there exists a Riemannian manifold whose isometry group is that compact group, is that? Yes, and this, uh, Manifold is also compact, that we can construct a compact manifold out of this group. I'm not sure if this is true. Oh, I see. So I guess if you just take the group to be, uh, the manifold to be the group itself, and if we just uh, put uh, a kind of left invariant metric on the group, then certainly the group acts by left action on itself. So this would be, um, so certainly this acts as isometries, but are there any other isometries beyond that? Uh, okay, so there might be others, yeah. 
So yeah. outer automorphisms might exist. And the yeah. question is whether they are isometries, it's not obvious. It's not obvious, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the outer is yeah, automorphisms that are not, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. So so I'm not sure, yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. So maybe, maybe uh, yeah, it would be nice if you send your uh, questions by emails also, because uh, Bobak is typing these things, these uh, notes, and then we can put all these questions uh, in, in the note also. That would be wonderful. So I really want you to send us the questions that you ask in class, so not forget that. And uh, I trust that you have all got these uh, a set of assignments. So it's, it's not assignments, sorry, these are, problems, it's kind of suggested problems just for self-study right now. I mean, is that, did you all get it, I guess, right? Uh, I haven't been added to OWL yet. Are they on OWL? Oh, can you, do you have access to OWL? No, I haven't been added yet. Oh, you haven't? So, Bob, I, do you want to write, uh, what's your name, please? Uh, it's, it's Nathan. Oh, Nathan. Oh, yeah, yeah. But you, oh, yeah, yeah. So Nathan, I think you, you are uh, you are local, so you should because you took the course, right? Yeah, I'm registered, but I'm registered late, so perhaps I need to be added manually. It could be, yeah. So Bob, I will add uh, all of you uh, who are not there for sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm also not uh, added to Owl yet. Okay. So what are what is your name? I'm Luke. <laughs> oh, sorry, Luke. <laughs> You're, you're talking from some distance, or maybe I'm, <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Bobak will add all, all, all your names to the, to the owl, and then you will have access to those uh, suggested uh, kind of self-study problems that that we could. I'm thinking about some projects for you. So if you have ideas of projects uh, you wanna do, that would be wonderful and let me know, but I will have a list also, some suggested lists. So there are a lot of fantastic topics uh, that one can, one can pursue and that would be good. Any other questions or comments? So the, the stimulus result, I think the if and only if holds if we uh, assume that G acts on M transitively, right? Because the other direction, we have that M would be a quotient of G. And if G is compact, then M would be compact. Oh, yes. It should be, yeah, I think you're saying if it acts transitively, then yeah, but that's a very strong condition to, to assume that it's, it's acting transitively. So I'm completely in, in the fog now, right? I mean, just, uh, I have to think about it, but thank you for mentioning it. I mean, if we take just R2 uh, and multiply the usual flat metric with some random function, I'm pretty yes. sure we will get no isometries. Yeah, exactly. So it will become so inhomogeneous. Indeed, that's a very good idea. It becomes so inhomogeneous that it's very hard to construct any non-trivial non isometry. Indeed, yeah, yeah, that's a very good. So yeah, I mean, you can just take a random function, scale like a while factor, scale it by that, and then uh, indeed, yes, yes. That would be, um, then, the, then the isometry group will be just identity, which is trivial, but. So guys, I have to run out now. So uh, thank you so much. Yeah. See you on Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you. So I just stopped recording.